Hello and welcome to In Control, the first podcast on control theory. Here we discuss the science of feedback, decision making, artificial intelligence, and much more. I'm your host, Alberto Padoan, live from our recording studio at ETH Zurich. Quick thanks to our sponsor, the National Center of Competence in Research on Dependable Ubiquitous Automation, which you can check following the link in the description. Our guest today is Ben Recht. Ben is a full professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley. Ben has received a number of awards. I'm just going to mention that Ben received the New Rips Test of Time Award twice. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thanks for having me. So perhaps one nice way to start this podcast is uh, to say that you predicted the existence of this podcast. In an IFAC plenary uh, about two years ago, if I'm not wrong, you said this. Um, and I'm just kind of considering this like an experiment in podcasting because the world really needs a control theory podcast. Maybe there is one. If there is one, I'm happy to participate send me an email. I'd love to jump on your control theory podcast. So Ben, you did envision this happening. So where should I invest my money? <laughs> what else can you predict? <laughs> did, I, did, I, did I predict or did I cause? I mean, I think that's, the, that's always the, the, the tricky question with all of these things, right? Well, th there is a funny um, anecdote here. I was absolutely not aware of you mentioning this thing. I did not participate to that conference, nor did I uh, watch the, your, your lecture before somebody told me in our department. And then I went on the internet, I found it, your uh, plenary on YouTube, and I was so pleased to see that <laughs> somehow you managed to predict this thing. Yeah, man. So Alberto, why did you decide that you, you, I mean, independently decide that you wanted to do a <laughs> control centric podcast? Well, you know, there's so many other podcasts uh, out there uh, about artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, even soft robotics. So uh, I guess it's time for us to step up or step out of our right. <laughs> academic rooms and uh, maybe talk about our cool stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, perhaps a, a, a good starting point for our um, uh, chat today will be about your personal trajectory. Uh, how did it all start? Uh, that's, I, how, how early should I go? <laughs> as much as you <laughs> oh, want. No, it's, a, it's a little bit hard, right? I mean, Six I months in, I if you know. want. Yeah, I mean, right? <laughs> like, where, I mean, I mean can't, having a hard time remembering how I got got to the uh, my office today. So it's a lot. It's trying to <laughs> dig back into some to old, ancient times. I don't know. It's, it's interesting, right? I think. Um, uh, we're in this funny period of, uh, of recruiting graduate students. And um, I always like to ask graduate students why they want to go to graduate school. Um, and I, my, I actually, I stole this one from my wife. One of the questions I, I ask them is like, or I tell them is, you know, if you could envision yourself doing anything else other than going to graduate school, um, you should probably just do that. I, I firmly believe that. I really feel like if you can figure out some other thing that would make you happy and fulfilled and that, you know, maybe it's risky, maybe it's not. I still, I still suggest that people do that. Uh, but for whatever reason, I wasn't one of those people. Um, I kind of fell into the, the going to graduate school thing after college. I wasn't sure. I mean, I, don't, I was always, you know, good in school. And, and, but I always had this, I had a lot of other passions. I was really into music as a high school kid and college kid. And, um, by the time I got to my senior year of college, I thought to myself, either I'm going to do one of two things. I'm either going to go um, and tr tr try to volunteer at all of these recording uh, studios in Chicago, where I was going to undergraduate, or I'll go to graduate school. And then I looked at the graduate schools. I found one that looked kind of interesting at MIT, where they were doing a bunch of weird stuff. And it was like, OK, this looks different. It would be a big change. They're kind of doing stuff related to music. I'll just apply there. And it was very dumb. I mean, me as a 22 year old, just, I had no, I mean, I don't know. It was not very well thought out process to how I uh, ended up uh, where I am. But I, I think it was, it's interesting to go from, you know, I, I did uh, pure math as an undergraduate. I decided pretty early on, um, well, not pretty early on. Actually, I remember that when I decided I couldn't be a mathematician. Um, and it, was this, it was in a class on commutative algebra. We had done some kind of, 
proof in this class that required uh, six chalkboards, and it was just a diagram drawing all, all the other chalkboards. And then I was, I just had that was one of those wake up and be like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life days. And I was like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. So I kind of just wandered around a lot, but it was one of those things where if I had if I'd had a better idea, I probably would not be where I am today. So um, I ended up at MIT, and that kind of changed a lot of my perspectives, going from someplace very theoretical to someplace very applied. And so having those, having that big juxtaposition, um, that big pendulum shift has been something that has kind of gone on throughout my career, um, swinging back and forth between just doing very pure stuff and then trying to get myself into more applied areas, uh, sometimes successful and sometimes not. And, um, and then bouncing back into theory and uh, also just having a lot of, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the right way to put this is, but like the attention span of a, of a gnat just like not not being able to really necessarily focus too long on one thing, um, right? I think this is one of the fun things about being a professor. Every, everybody could be a professor in a different way. There are some people who are going to spend their entire careers like improving one inequality because that's the that's what they care about. Um, and then I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing the opposite. I I change what I want to work on every uh, every couple of weeks, maybe. No, I think it's every. I I, I think that's selling myself a little short. Yeah, but I, but I do have a hard time spending more than a few years on a given topic. Um, and I mean, I guess we'll get to this, but I will say right now, I'm not super deep into control at the moment. So that was something that that was a that that phase currently is over. But control is something I've come back and forth with for for my entire career. So I'm sure I'll come back. Yeah. Um, so I was curious about how did you stumble uh, on control theory? Yeah. Um, that was just one of those weird life coincidences, I think. Um, I got very lucky. Um, so I I mean, I think with a lot of these things, one of the things we underappreciate about uh, academics in general is just these network connections that kind of take you to where you go, right? It's all about people. It's so much more about people than it is necessarily about um, uh, particularities of research problems as to why you end up in a place. And so when I was pretty early on in graduate school, uh, I went to, I went to a talk, uh, by John Doyle and, uh, I just, I, I appreciated his style, which hopefully a lot of people here have seen at one point or another. Um, and it ended up talking to him a bunch after the talk with some graduate students. Um, I re I'll always remember, he said to me, I like you, you have no tact. I'll remember that I, th that's will stick with me forever. Um, but yeah, so once I met John, John actually introduced me to, uh, Raf Dandrea, who had been doing a sabbatical in Boston. Uh, his wife was working at a, at a company in Boston. Raf was currently at Cornell. This was before he was at ETH. And so, and then Raf and I hung out for a bit. And yeah, that was kind of how it all started. So it was John, then Raf, and then I met a bunch of other people. Um, and it was, yeah, that was my, so again, random connection. Randomly, John liked me. And I think that was kind of the, uh, uh, that was the beginning. This is super cool, I guess, also, given that you mentioned uh, the influence of John, this is probably also one of the reasons a posteriori of your interest on robust control and perhaps bridging robust control to uh, the world of machine learning. Um, yeah. I guess my last question before we, we pause and move on, uh, let's say, to more technical uh, terrain, um, is about the people that influenced uh, your research. So if you had to name three of them, I guess one would be probably John Doyle, as you mentioned. Definitely John. Yeah. Uh, but what about the other two then? Um, it's a great, wow. Other people who've influenced by research. I mean, I think, I think again, the way you want, to, the way I think about it, is not necessarily. And I probably could dig into this more and think about like who are the people who I read who like really changed the way I thought. But I, I think a lot of the times it's just who are the people who are there to to mentor me and to kind of lead me in these different directions. Um, I would say, uh, you know, uh, Steve Wright had a huge impact on my, um, both on my professional career and the way I think about optimization. Um, so uh, Steve was really instrumental in recruiting me to Wisconsin where I was before Berkeley. Um, and he was just really um, both a, a, a personal mentor and also just taught me so much about the ins and outs of optimization research. So I think Steve is another person who really stands out in my head as a real, uh, a huge influence. Um, let me think about 
who, who else? Because this is always tricky. Um, because there have been a lot of other people who I've just really enjoyed working with. Like, I, you know, I, I like Raf for, for bringing me into control and taking me in those directions. Pretty soon after I met Raf and John, Pablo Perillo um, moved from ETH to MIT. Uh, look at all these ETH connections. <laughs> he moved from ETH to MIT. And then, um, uh, you know, I, I learned so much from, from Pablo. Um, you know, Dimitri Bertsekis also at MIT is someone I, I've talked with a lot about so many different things at different points. I think what Dimitri is interesting because I learned convex analysis from him. That was my first real interaction with him. And I learned a lot about optimization algorithms, but it was kind of, you know, it wasn't until I don't, many years later that I got into optimal control, reinforcement learning, and Dimitri had done so much work there. So it was kind of fun to reconnect with him in that space because we had done so much, so much of our chatting had been about optimization, then optimization and machine learning, but then it kind of looped back to the stuff that he was just the, you know, he was one of the most important researchers in, in dynamic programming. Um, and it just wasn't, you know, it's just funny that you know, we go through these trend cycles. Um, dynamic programming wasn't maybe as hot a topic when I was in graduate school, but uh, it was kind of fun to kind of loop back with him. I certainly have more Bert Seika's books than I think any other person. <laughs> this is an interesting trivia. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, he writes so many books. Yeah. It's not really fair. So many good books, I would say. <laughs> I mean, they're all excellent. They're all excellent. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But it's, it's just also not, I mean, I don't know how anyone could keep up with that kind of um, uh, prolificness. It's so impressive. Uh, and you're right. Like, it's amazing how many of them are good. Right, I mean, his nonlinear optimization book is just is just filled with amazing things, and uh, he had that classic book on. I mean, it was amazing. I forgot about that. He wrote this book on distributed computing with Sitziklas. Mm -hmm. Like in the, I don't even remember when that book was from. It's old, and it kind of came back um, in the early 2010s. Was a very like everybody was into distributed machine learning. It turns out that anything you wanted was almost certainly in that book already. <laughs> And so I remember interacting with him a lot about that. He was he was a little bit upset, honestly, that like some people didn't realize that, which, but it worked out, um, right? So it was distributed computing. He had done dynamic programming. He had done all sorts of stuff on on stochastic gradients. Just a really impressive person. And um, I think I think there is this not lots of people will write lots of papers, but not there are really very few people who will can turn a research program into courses, right? That's a, that's a hard jump to take something that is like, this is my research and I'm going to turn this into something that I could teach to, you know, first year graduate students. That's taking cutting edge stuff and turning it into that kind of synthesis is, you know, really, really hard. And Dimitri's just incredibly talented at it. Yeah. This requires incredible mental clarity. I'll just take this uh, assist that you served me um, to mention that all the people that you mentioned <laughs> before are very welcome in this podcast <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> you should, I, Dimitri would be a fun person to chat with, honestly. I think he would be, I mean, they're all fun. John, John, will, John always is fun, but I think Dimitri has a lot of very interesting perspectives. You should, I should, I'll send a pic yeah, to let, him. Let, let's I see what we can do. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so maybe, maybe we can move on to... Um, Absolutely. I would probably start with uh, Argmin, your legendary blog, <laughs> at least legendary for the that. underground community of machine learning and control geeks. Uh, oh, nice. You posted a wealth of super interesting uh, blog posts there. Uh, perhaps if I had to summarize the context of your own enterprise there would be something like, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what, what do you say about this? I mean, that's certainly true. <laughs> so the question is, is, is the gap bigger in theory or practice? And I, I actually, I think most of the time we say that it, the gap is bigger in practice, but I don't know. It just, it just depends. I mean, I see some pretty lo loose bounds, I mean, especially in the things I've been working with. Um, actually, many times in my career, you see these things where the theory is much more pessimistic than it need be. So, uh, you know, um, it's, it's interesting to see um, that interplay. Yeah. No, the, the blog has been a very fun outlet for me. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, you know, b busting myths is really your cottage, uh, industry somehow. <laughs> so I was wondering what was your 
favorite myth to be busted or w- w- what would you be willing to to do like in the future what's the ultimate myth to bust i think sometimes the one i mean I, the ones i've found most interesting were the ones i believed uh. right where i where it just completely changes my mind um and usually this is going to be something led by a graduate student or a postdoc in the group and they just show you something that uh, or show me something that i just don't would never have believed a day before. Um, I think probably like the, there are probably lots of good examples here, but a really notable one and one I've been writing about um, again recently um, is there's this concept in machine learning and statistics of overfitting to, to data, right? I mean, where the idea would be that somehow you believe a little bit too much in your data and are unable to extrapolate out to new data because you've really, you know, you, you, you've somehow caught on to aberrations in and particularities of the data set you have. So it's a very common thing. And we teach it to our undergraduates that, you know, overfitting is a huge problem. Um, and in particular, the way that we do machine learning causes overfitting. So what, what, let me, let me dive into that. Yeah. Let's jump do, into this. W- Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So what we do in machine learning, um, uh, just from the beginning of time, it turns out, um, <laughs> and I could talk more about, I could talk more about the history of this because I've also been absolutely, absolutely. Very involved to try to dig into some of the history. Feel free to express, uh, your own necessities, if, scratch your own itches if you want. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so, so from the, from the beginning of time in machine learning, there was this notion that you would have. Uh, a data set that you train on, mm-hmm. a data set that you evaluate or test on, yes. and then the data in the wild. Mm-hmm. And so um, and it turns out that this, this, the earliest we found of this practice goes back to the late 1950s. It's a really old idea. Um, and it's kind, of, it's kind of amazing that it was, it was, I mean, a lot of people think of that as an idea that comes from statistics, and it's an idea that comes from machine learning before statistics. It's, oh, very, okay. it's interesting how early that Hashtag is. Hashtag today I learned. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I think one thing that I've learned and something I never appreciated before was, uh, before recently, was, you know, that machine learning and statistics are much more contemporary than I think we realize. I think we th- a lot of people think statistics is very old because mm-hmm. probability is very old. But statistics is kind of the, the you know the appropriate application of probabilistic thinking to how we interact with the real world, and I think those kinds of real aspects weren't nailed down to the '30s, 1930s, which is just fascinating. I mean, there was work by um, you know notably Ronald Fisher and some of his predecessors, and and uh, uh, Gossett, who was the guy who invented the t-test. This was done in the 20s or so, but that wasn't really until the 30s where there was like a real rigorous body of statistics, notably by um, Jersey name and kind of nailed that down. But and it's kind of crazy to think that that's the 30s. <laughs> it's yeah. like, you would think that that would be the 1830s, but it's the 1930s. It's much, much later than than I think um, people appreciate. So that so machine learning is roughly 1950s and really was well established by 1960. So it's only a gap of, you know, what, what are we talking about here? Like 25 years, not decades, not, uh, sorry, not like, you know. It's insane. A, a century. So it was really a gap of about 25 years. Yeah. To the, f- the full foundation of statistical machine learning and the full foundation of statistics. They're very intertwined with each other. So I think that's. And where does machine learning st- start for you with the perceptron? Um, with the kind of like the, the understanding of how the perceptron works. Okay. Uh, and it's not, and it's not just the perceptron because there are other things that people were experimenting with at the time, lots of different, even like model based methods. Um, if you kind of go back to literature, but really just the idea of understanding that there's this, you know, in sample versus out sample performance, I could characterize in sample performance and out of sample performance, um, in some kind of particular way. This was really this is late 1950s through early 1960s was where these ideas really came together. Yeah, and, and going back to the myth that you actually want to bust here, am I yeah. understanding correctly that what you say is that we should overfit or we shouldn't be scared to overfit or? No. <laughs> well, I think it's that we shouldn't be scared to overfit. So okay. one, one of the things that people kind of thought and statisticians have said this is that if you you look at what we're doing where we have you know some data set and some testing set and we're just always you know using the this one data set and then evaluating on the testing set and repeating this process you know you could construct really weird examples where you 
essentially overfit to this testing set, and then you get some new data, and then you've just done you just do terribly. So there there's there are w ways to construct examples where that happens. Um, and in my group, we've done now just hundreds and hundreds of experiments where showing that that just doesn't happen. So we've done a lot of re reproduction studies where we'll reproduce test sets, trying to be as close as possible to the generating process of the original test set. And we've done this for data sets that like the ImageNet data set or the Squad data set or a variety of others where we can regenerate these kind of um, test sets. And we see that you don't, there's no overfitting. The models that perform the best on um, the original test set are the ones that perform the best on the new data. So it completely goes against what you were told. So you can't... How do you explain this? Um, that is a wonderful question. I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I don't. I, I wish I had a good answer for that. I think that's to me. I mean, you know, sometimes there's like we almost expect too much from our theory. Okay. Uh, and that's okay. And uh, we're. I, I think there are a variety of. Um, there are a variety of explanations. Some of them. Some of them are mathematical, and then some of them are just sociological. I think. Uh, I think that, that you know we pick problems very carefully in machine learning such that they're not hurt by overfitting. I think that's part of it. Like we're the problems that we're looking at tend to be not the not the weird egregious examples that we come up with as uh, uh, counterexamples. So I think that's one part. Um, I think another part is that there are a, a lot of the analysis that would predict overfitting assumes some very um, pathological behavior. In, in, in the statistics to, to happen. And, you know, the way that we actually work, there are a variety of different ways that, you know, um, if, for example, if predictors kind of are correlated, like they kind of give you correlated answers, you know, the, the bounds on overfitting get better. So it looks like you can actually have more models. Uh, if you don't really hyper optimize um, um, to, to the, the test error score, that also can kind of prevent overfitting. So there's a variety of like these little tricks and maybe each one of those is, is, is explains a little piece, uh, but I don't think there is, uh, I, right now I don't have a satisfactory explanation for why um, we're, we don't actually see this kind of overfitting behavior. I'll say this though, the reason why, I'm not spending too much time worrying about it because the other thing we observed is that while you, you see the models that perform really well on the new, on the old test set perform really well on the newer, data, they almost always perform worse on the newer data than they did on the original old data. So now everybody's performing worse. It's not that, you, you know, so again, it's, it's not that we overfit necessarily. It's just that small changes uh, in, in the data creation process can create large changes in the actual predictive performance. And that's worrying. That's not really an issue of overfitting. That's just an issue of extrapolation. Um, and it's interesting how sensitive machine learning methods can be to small changes in how data uh, uh, presents itself. There are so many directions that I can take off from here. I yeah, mean, for, well, go first ahead. of all, I guess the first naive comment uh, on this issue is that it seems to me that this could be a, an issue of genericity in some way, or so, like the yeah. the data that we get, or better, the way we build models on the data that we get uh, somehow do not suffer from some sort of genericity problem and vice versa. Uh, we may be too sensitive to the data somehow and so therefore we get worse errors on new data whenever yeah. we get new data. Yeah. Um, Would this be fair to say from your point of view? So I don't claim to have answers for this, so I, I don't I don't know yet. But 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 I but I do think there are some things that we don't necessarily consider very frequently in machine learning that we should, um, which is just that there all of experimental science kind of suffers from this generalization problem. Um, there are things that you do in a laboratory setting that you go and go do out in a clinical setting, and they just don't pan out the way you want them to, right? I mean, I think this is kind of very very common in in medicine where you do, you know, you build this drug, it looks really good, you go and deploy it, and it's not quite as good as you wanted it to be. Um, and this is also true in psychology, where you do a study, and you know, you do a study on a bunch of college-aged males, perhaps, and then you try to see, does this apply to, you know, 
middle-aged women and it doesn't because that's obviously a huge enough context shift that you see it. Um, so, so on the one hand, understanding how to deal with those um, shifts between context and, and populations from the experimental setting to the general setting is hugely important. And it's something uh, very like that. That's something that we're doing a lot of active research on in my group. So that's one thing. I think the warning though, that's still very troubling is that in the machine learning context, these data sets don't really look that different and you see a large difference. The fact that you could have two data sets that kind of look the same and have a huge difference in performance really freaks me out about machine learning. Indicating some sort of high sensitivity somehow. Super high sensitivity, yeah. And what, what people do in practice, and so we can tell our tell our listeners, you know, the fix for this in practice is is constant retraining. And there's a lot of that. Could you explain, like give an analogy of what yeah. that means maybe for the audience? So this would be the kind of thing where you constantly look for your, you know, you, you act as you have something deployed, you constantly look for errors in your deployed system. And as soon as you see them, or even this, maybe not if you see them, you're still collecting data and you use that data to retrain the model. Um, and this is definitely a very commonplace way to get around the sensitivity and something that's very common in um, industrial applications of machine learning. You, you do have to refine the models. You do have to retrain the models. Um, they're very unstable to <laughs> to, to to the ravages of time. Yeah, um, maybe for the control theoretically oriented audience out there, I suppose yeah. that we are kind of speaking of robustness in this guise. Am I am I wrong? Probably, probably. I think one thing that's interesting that is missing, um, and that changes things pretty dramatically, is is feedback. So these predictive things, you know, you're just you're at the whim of the prediction. And so you're kind of, you're never able to really course correct. I think one of the fascinating things about control is we know that even with poor prediction, we can have stable and robust behavior by proper design and feedback design, right? And that's one of the more fascinating, underappreciated aspects of control. And you're giving me another assist uh, to shift gears and yeah, uh, talk ahead. about your excursion into uh control theory, I suppose. So sure. um, you've written a fantastic series of uh, blog posts uh, on uh, Argmin about reinforcement learning and its connection uh, to optimal control. And this turned out to be also a fantastic paper on the annual reviews on control. Maybe we can speak about that if you if you like. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so summarizing your journey um, in this area would be impossible in uh, <laughs> a few seconds, but sure. maybe uh, if it's not too much to ask to you, could you give us a sense of your personal perspective on your journey in control maybe? Yeah, so this is now, I have to think a little, I have to think back to it. I, I used to have a good story for how I got into it again. I mean, I'm assuming that what we're talking about is, you know, my recent engagement with um, reinforcement learning. Yes. Because I, you know, I had, uh, um, I did some work on distributed control as a graduate student. I've done some work on system identification. I did, uh, as a postdoc, I go back and forth with control and, and, and dynamical systems. How I'm trying to remember exactly what got me interested because it's been, it's been so long, but I'm guessing what happened. Well, just again, this is a little bit of a guess, but I'm just trying to trying to put myself back in a 2014 mindset is um, uh, there were a few things that were afoot. First of all, there was a lot of hype around reinforcement learning in 2014. And it is crazy that that's now eight years ago. That's really wild to me. Yeah, It definitely did not. I don't think it actually ended up paying out the way that people were talking the way they were talking about it, like self-driving cars in 2020. Uh, they were definitely saying that in 2014, and it just didn't happen. Uh, it'd be nice if they could actually, you know, reflect on that. But I think they've moved on to Bitcoin or something. They're onto something new. I don't. Know. Yeah, Elon Musk is buying Twitter. I don't know. We're doing <laughs> other stuff. We're moving on. <laughs> but I think it would be helpful to have some reflection on well, why, why didn't that pan yeah, out? We're, right? we're here um, also for that purpose. I mean, locomotion <laughs> was another big one, I suppose. Uh, yeah, so locomotion came, I, I think, came a little bit later. But for me, the big things that were, I think, you know, happening at Berkeley was there was a lot of interest in self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. And then there were a few really interesting papers that were fusing. Uh, I was very interested in this paper by um, 
Chelsea Finn and Sergey Levine and Peter Abiel, Trevor Darrell, it kind of showed that you could like uh, learn these visual, you could do control directly from video. That was a, it was a very, a very impressive. That's paper. one of the holy grails, yeah. I suppose, like merging perception and control in yeah. a principled way. That's, this is one of the first to do it in a compelling way, I think. Um, so people were very excited about that. So I think we just started digging in a little bit in the group about, you know, what's going on here. I was like, I know control theory. I know machine learning. I should be able to do this. I think it was something like that. And, and, and I was like, also, I didn't believe a lot of what people were selling. So we started looking into that. And um, yeah, it led us down quite a, quite a path from there, I think. yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the cool things that ended up um, happening was that of merging or at least connecting uh, the world of robust control yeah. and with that of high dimensional statistics. And uh, Absolutely. I think that was a major achievement from my very humble perspective in the sense that, oh, appreciate that. Um, robust control tends to uh, assume that uncertainties are somehow bounded, yeah. but we never really explain where uh, those bounds come from. Whereas maybe um, machine learning can kind of help us in estimating those uncertainties from uh, finite sample statistics, finite sample, finite data, if you yeah. want. Would that make sense to you as a, a short summary yeah, absolutely. of your excursion? No, absolutely. Well, that's part of it. I mean, I think definitely there was a, I mean, th like the other way I'd say that is that machine learning is also very bad about quantifying the uncertainty in its predictions. It's terrible. <laughs> so it's this kind of thing where if you assume, if you assume a lot of things about a generative process, if you assume a lot of things about how the data is coming to you, I can give you some kind of uncertainty quantification, but you can never check whether or not those things you were supposed to assume are true. It's actually, I think one of these things that's a little worrying sometimes in machine learning is this reliance on probability. Um, I think, um, honestly, I'm, this is a John Doyle thing that was hammered into me, is that you should never add stochastics until you need to. Okay. Which I think is a very interesting perspective. Don't add stochastics until you need to. and. So when is it that you need to then? That's the hard question. So in machine learning, we don't have any theory without some kind of notion of, um, um, well. A fully deterministic uh, machine okay. learning. So no, no, there is actually, and this is actually really fascinating. There is a fully deterministic machine learning. We just don't really appreciate it. Uh, it's just because it's not accessible. I'll say this, my, I, I love my friends who work on this stuff, but it's not very accessible. So. You could, there's a notion in machine learning that's called regret. Huh. Yes. And, and re regret has this idea that what you will look at is, you know, you'll have some sequence and you'll say, you know, this is the best thing that could have been predicted. The best predictions you could have made about the sequence. Somehow, if you were omniscient or like you saw the whole sequence in advance, um, and then you compare that to how well your algorithm makes predictions. Okay, so you have something like, if I hold, saw this somehow, saw the whole sequence, what would be the best predictor I could build? Which would be funny, right? You're somehow saying, I saw everything that happened, and now you're going to tell me how could I predict, you know, Tuesday from Monday, given that I've already seen Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's a little bit of a confusing setup, but, let's, but that's a very strong assumption, right? So assuming that you could see all of that future information what would be the best prediction you could have ever made? And that's deterministic. It only depends on the actual uh, values that you saw on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday. There's no distribution, there's no sampling, nothing like that. I found absolutely interesting uh, the <laughs> linearization principle so, <laughs> by which you say that if a machine learning algorithm does crazy things when restricted to linear models, it's going to do crazy things on complex nonlinear models too. And I think that if we remove machine learning and just say control, probably we get the same <laughs> output. I think it's similar. And honestly, Iserman is kind of like, was a, a bit of an inspiration for that as well. I mean, I feel like a lot of the, um, I know Iserman was talking about feedback with a, now we're getting to the weeds of memoryless nonlinearity, but I think that this, um, uh, we, we learned a lot about um, optimization from kind of looking at um, Iserman's conjecture and look, looked at, so I think there is this, that, that interplay happens everywhere. I think it just happens everywhere. Sometimes you just, you, you're surprised to see how many insights you can get from linear systems or from linear regression. 
Absolutely. I'm just going to mention for our audience that Eiserman is very well known for a conjecture, uh, an eponymous conjecture related to the stability of a feedback loop that involves uh, a nonlinearity plus some kind of bounds. You can Google that, probably find it on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah and uh, touching on this point, I suppose, the running example of your whole enterprise in control has been LQR. <laughs> I for better for worse. <laughs> for better for worse. Yeah. And um, it was just so fascinating to see, I mean, how much else can we say about it, uh, at least r regarding this somewhat old problem uh, with new yeah. eyes, with somebody, uh, with the eyes of someone who has been extensively working also with other communities, such as machine learning. And I guess yeah. your main finding in this respect would be that. Uh, certainty equivalence work. That's a big one. I think. Let's see. The, the, so yeah, my group did a lot of stuff on on LQR. Um, I will say that, like, what the, I love that certainty. Let me come back to certainty equivalence. Yes, in a please. Because I, I do, I do love that result. But um, I think the thing that we got the whole group super excited was uh, Nikolai Motney, who's now a faculty member at Penn, uh, visited us as a postdoc. Uh, and we had been really trying to figure out how to understand, well, what do you do when you have this kind of bad fit LQR model and you do control and what was the right way to analyze it? Like, how can you even talk about how to analyze this thing where, you know, you're doing some kind of reinforcement learning? Do I fit the model? Do I do something else? And um, my students, Sarah Dean, Horiamania, Stephen Tu, figured out a cool way to like kind of quantify the uncertainty in a, a when you fit an LQR model to data. And they have really they've done a lot since on that too. So they they really but but we couldn't figure out what you do with that certainty equivalence. And so we tried a bunch of different ideas. Um, sorry, not with certainty equivalence. Apologies. Let me step back. What, what do you do with that uncertainty qu quantification, right? And so now you have this thing where I have a linear system with uncertain parameters. And we tried to use a bunch of different ideas from robust control. And we kept running into walls in the analyses. Um, you know, we worked, we were talking a lot with Andy Packard um, and we had a lot of interesting ideas like mu synthesis related ideas that maybe could have worked. There's a lot of the stuff that could have worked, but what was mind blowing is, you know, Nikolai came and within two weeks, he applied this stuff that he had been working on, which he calls system level synthesis and uh, yeah, within two weeks, we had an uh, amazing theorem that showed that how to do it, you know, we could quantify how many samples you needed to do robust control of a system where you have a, you know, you want to do quadratic LQR, you want to minimize the quadratic cost, you have uncertain linear dynamics, and we could quantify how many samples you needed to get an uncertainty quantification of the system that was good enough to do um, near optimal control. Really fascinating result. Maybe um, we can step back here just to help the audience yeah. a little bit and yeah. just mention what is SLS. Uh, I am aware uh -huh. of what that is, uh, uh -huh. but maybe you can help me with an analogy uh, for the audience, uh, like to explain what, what what that does and what it means. Yeah, so, uh, so system level synthesis, I think there are multiple ways to kind of think about what that, <laughs> how we approach that problem. Um, it, or how we approach thinking about that problem. Um, and I'm trying to think what's the best one that, you're, that the control theoretic audience will grasp onto. I mean, as always is the case of control, people are going to say, oh, we did it this way in the 80s. Oh, we did it this way in the 60s. I don't want to necessarily step on anyone's toes. Let me just explain roughly what, the, what this is thinking. Is um, You can think about most of the internal maps in control systems as mapping from a disturbance, which consists of your initial state and kind of the... and and the actual disturbance signal to either the state. A controller also is just a map from the disturbance to the control. Uh, and system level synthesis works directly with those maps. The map that maps disturbance to state, the one that maps disturbance to control. Um, and just gives you a, a, a very kind of straightforward linear al algebraic approach to doing control synthesis where you're working with these abstract maps rather than working with um, um, you know, the actual parameters A, B, and C that you would have in a linear system. Now, why is that better? Uh, it's just this, in effect, lifts everything into a higher dimensional space where everything becomes nice. Problems that weren't convex become convex, uh, which is why we find it really useful. Um, 
Why is this the right mapping? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think a, another way to think about it, if you're working in finite time, is that you know the 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 map from disturbance to state is going to be some like toplets matrix with a bunch of parameters in it, and you just have to understand that you know those parameters can't be arbitrary. They're going to you know they're going to have some relationship. Essentially, a finite impulse response. Yeah, and so it's working with those impulse responses and putting these things together in a, in, in a very clean fashion. So. It's surprisingly powerful. And, you know, this ideas do appear in other places. I believe in model predictive control, this is called disturbance feedback. I think that's the name. There's definitely something where you, you operate with this map that maps the, the error disturbance into your state and the error disturbance into your controller. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's the, the high level. I always feel like it's, it's almost the thing that's funny about it. I love it. I think it's very easy to work with. I could probably teach people how to operate with it. But uh, it kind of led to the second thing, which came a little bit later, which was work by Horiamania and Stephen Tu, which I think it was kind of was was a. It's not surprising, but this is one of these wonderful things where theory and practice collide. So what we saw with the SLS is that when you have very little data, you did need to have some kind of quantification of the uncertainty in order to get stable performance. But as you start to just get a reasonable amount of data, not too much, just a, a reasonable amount of data, what you could just do is fit the model using least squares and then plug the model in as if it was true and run your optimal controller with this estimated model as if the estimated model was true, right? So this is the, whenever I say as if the estimated model was true or as if the estimated X was true, we tend to call that certainty equivalence, right? This assuming a certain level of uncertainty is not there. This is the certainty equivalent model. Assuming there was no noise, this would be what the... Optimism in the face of uncertainty. It's a, it's a form of, well, that's interesting. Optimism in the face of uncertainty is a little bit more aggressive than certainty equivalence. Optimism in the face of uncertainty. So it's actually, these three things are different. So the robust control view mm -hmm. is you assume uh, you have data. There's going to be a bunch of models consistent with your data. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, I'm going to pick the one. The robust control view is I'm going to pick the model that's consistent with my data, but would give me the worst performance. That's robust control. Very pessimistic, right? And they're going to say, well, given that, then what? how do we do design? Um, certain equivalence just says, I'm going to ignore the uncertainty. Just pretend it's not there, and then what would I do? Optimism in the face of uncertainty says, given all of the models that are consistent with my, with my data, I'm going to pick the one that gives me the best performance, Okay, which is incredibly aggressive. And the idea there is you, 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 uh, you know, either you're right, in which case, great. <laughs> Or you're wrong and you learn that quickly. <laughs> so that's, that's the, a nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah, that's the idea. So, but also, to, you tell that to a control engineer and I, they get a little terrified, I think. So <laughs> I think the, tend to be quite conservative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody wants to, you don't want to fail quickly. That doesn't seem good. Um, um, but so just to go back to the certainty equivalence mm -hmm. very quickly. Yeah, um, sure, absolutely. So what, what, what did we do there? What, so this idea where you just, you know, fit some ARMA model to your data and then pretend as if it was true, it's kind of a, is a staple of engineering, right? I mean, people do that all the time in control engineering. And what Horian and Stevens showed, which is remarkable, is that once you have enough data, that is the optimal thing to do. Not only is it a good thing to do, it's the optimal thing to do. And in fact, that does suggest something that the first clause I said was, if you have enough data, what it suggests is in the lab, do as many experiments as you can. Always be sure that you have enough data because you're almost never in a lab setting resource constraints. So collect as much data as you can. And then once you do that, you can deploy this uh, model. You could ignore the uncertainty and you'll be fine. It's kind of amazing. And I, I do think that basically, what, I mean, I don't want to, again, don't want to step on any engineer's toes, but so many engineers who are working on mission critical systems just do that and it's okay. I think it's interesting to justify 50 years of practice with a theorem. It's nice. Yeah. Plus the fact that we somehow flew to the moon in the 70s or 60s. Right? <laughs> right. Now we use feedback. And so the feedback was important. But I think I think it's just kind of understanding, you know, how sensitive we really are to those kind of modeling errors. Um, and it's I think what this is always one thing that's amazing and fascinating control is. You can interpret the robust control mindset as assuming we're going to be sensitive to everything. But I don't, I don't think that's fair. I think robust control at its best is just telling you what you should be looking out for. Right? It's not saying 
don't don't do anything. That's the most robust. <laughs> the most robust thing is just don't. Um, but it, it's just saying these are the these are some pitfalls that you might not see, and can we identify where those pitfalls pitfalls are? Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about is um, perhaps your outsider's view uh, of control and also of machine learning. You've been bouncing back and forth between all these fields, and I think this is one of your great strengths. So I was wondering whether you see something that control people should be excited about uh, for the future. And in general, what's the future of all these fields? How will they yeah. interact? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's a complicated question. <laughs> what should control theory folks be excited about? Huh. The work we did in reinforcement learning, uh, I think ended up spanning about five years of pretty dedicated work. I think I'm fairly certain it was the span of Sarah Dean's PhD. It's like we started when Sarah arrived and I'm pretty sure that or maybe it was one year before, but it might have been right when she arrived. And then she graduated last year. And so it, the group currently is working on very different projects. Um, and I think a lot of times in in research, um, that's actually a good horizon for a research uh, research agenda is the length of a PhD. So, so Sarah, I mean, and Sarah's done uh, so much amazing stuff in that space, and I think she cont will continue to do so um, uh, as faculty. But I think that so that I have currently now disengaged a bit from control, which I think is okay. Um, and I don't want to ever tell control theory folks or anybody really what they should be working on. I think that's always hard. But we do benefit from the influx of new ideas and <laughs> yeah, interact yeah. with uh, our neighbors. So we're we're just very curious about what you're up to. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, what, oh, that's what I was going to move to. I could tell you what I'm interested in. I'm not sure that everybody in control is yet going to be interested in. But I think that that's, um, you know, I think we'll, you know, I... I guess this was just to say, I'm sure I'm going to come back and write control theory papers again, just taking a couple of years off right now and we'll see where it goes. Um, so what are we, like the things that I think we're very interested in in our group um, are precisely these issues of um, external validation, um, understanding how to deal with predictive systems outside of the laboratory setting and uh, also kind of understanding how you can you know, re re refine these predictive systems uh, over time, which it, to be fair, that has a bit of a control theory sort of view, right? There's a feedback process that has to happen. Um, I think machine learning, the way it's commonly taught is a very static process. There's data that's static. You apply it to a test set that's static and you can run as many times as you want, but nothing changes. And the assumption is that the new data looks like the old data, so there's no dynamics. But how you run, you use machine learning or just statistical thinking in a dynamic world is what we're very interested in. So in some sense, that could touch on control. Um, absolutely. And the issue of causality, I, I suppose, as well, yeah. causal thinking. Yes, absolutely. I, mean, I was just going to say, though, I think one thing that's challenging for control theorists is that not everything in dynamics is control theory. And I think this is always a tricky part. I think that sometimes we tend to be touchy. Yeah, we tend to be touchy. <laughs> we tend to think that everything that's dynamic means that it's control. But I feel like, you know, um, control theorists or control theory in general, I think, should not oversell its reach, but it also shouldn't undersell. I, mean, I think so many profound developments of the 20th century are due to our understanding of control and what exactly that is. And whether that be, you know, um, frequency domain models of LTI systems, you know, that's powerful stuff. Don't sell that short. That obviously can't tell you about everything, but it tells you a lot, you know, in a similar way, you know, um, understanding optimal control tells you a lot, but not everything can be posed in that way, even if it's dynamic. And I think that that's some of the questions we're looking at now. We're just trying to figure out how do you pose them? What's the right way to think about them? And this is what your new series of blog posts, I suppose, will be all about. Is that right? Yeah, we're trying. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And it's so tricky. It's so tricky, especially because some of the applications we're interested in involve, you know, social systems and, and people. Um, you know, I think the one of the things that um, a lot of the folks in the group are interested in are, are you know, where computation and healthcare end up intersecting each other. Um, and so that could be in the space of clinical trials, that could be in the space of, you know, just 
how, I mean, it could be in the space of protocols for just how we train people to interact and treat their and care for their patients. And um, it could also be in the context of directly where machine learning just gets deployed in a healthcare setting. And how do you think about that? So these are these are three things that end up being a little step removed from what I was doing. It's interesting that they're a little bit focused on on healthcare, but you know certainly um, there are multiple reasons for that. I think one, um, I come from a family of healthcare providers, so I was I was a big disappointment because I didn't become a medical doctor. Uh, so hopefully make my parents a little bit you uh, make up for this regretful. i guess <laughs> yeah gotta make up for that for my parents no um, you you absolutely <laughs> are let's say on the point in the sense that uh, you're anticipating a question that i would have asked you from our audience uh, oh. essentially about technologies and ideas to follow in the next one to five years or one to ten years if you will. oh interesting and i guess then healthcare and healthcare applications is definitely one of them for you i think healthcare is a huge one yeah well i was going to say that the 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 you know i've always had some i've written a few papers on healthcare before it's always been a little bit of a backburnered interest but i think you know the the uh i can't lie that the pandemic kind of really got me way back into it <laughs> i think there's so much you know there's a the, the medical community for the first time ever embraced the preprint server uh, and all of its warts and all of its blessings, right? I mean, we could read all of these papers, you're upfront against all these papers, you really start to see how evidence is gathered. Now, it was in an extreme setting, it was in a crisis setting, so I don't think it's completely aligned with um, normal times, but then you start to dig into normal times and you're like, it's not that far off. And sometimes their decision-making is good and sometimes it's bad. And I think the other thing that happened, which makes it, you know, I think an interesting time is people are still pushing very hard to move algorithmic thinking into healthcare. And it's very messy. It's not cut and dry as to whether or not these things are going to be valuable. Um, I, I think they could be, but I think we want to be careful and we want to think about how to do that. So this is, these are the three main reasons why um, I think that healthcare is going to be a fun thing to be looking at moving forward. Um, I have a couple of other questions and then maybe we can uh, move to a bit more of a geeky territory if you want. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> so uh, one question that I was interested in asking you is about uh, the biological origin of learning. I was wondering whether you ever got interested in, in that topic and uh, I was listening just the other day to another podcast from uh, Google DeepMind, listening to Raya Hatzel speaking about essentially the origin of intelligence and the fact that it's very much yeah. related to motion and you know bacteria when they first evolved they had a competitive advantage in moving towards uh, food or other things i suppose <laughs> so i wonder whether you ever got interested in this area if you want in uh, the biological connections yeah with learning um so i didn't and i'm trying to think about why i have a couple i have a couple answers to why i never engaged i think You know, when I was in graduate school, artificial intelligence was a very dirty word. Um, and I, I still kind of feel that way. Um, I think historically... <laughs> Why do you say so? I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I just think at the time when they were deep in a winter and nobody was doing AI, I think it's really funny that all the people who are doing AI now are just doing machine learning and they just kind of stole it. I, I don't really understand why that was allowed to happen. I think a lot of the AI in the early 20th century, I, I, honestly, AI, sorry, 21st century, uh, I think a lot of AI in general is um, it's just a kind of bizarre fixation that like never quite makes sense um, to me. Other people get into it. Uh, but if we look historically again, because that's all I do these days, um, the foundations of AI and the foundations of predictive machine learning, just predictive modeling, um, they also arise at the same time in different communities. There was a big push by, you know, the uh, group of scientists to kind of brand something that was how the brain works and like we're going to build machines that mimic how the brain works. And I think if you read the preface of cybernetics by Wiener, I think he also was really keen into understanding, you know, some kind of building systems that act like people um, or, or that mimic people. I think one of the fascinating rec um, like reflections that Wiener had was that by the 60s, he considered this done. And what he says, which I think is, if you go again and read like the preface to the second edition of cybernetics, what he says is that, you know, while they, we learned a lot about psychology and trying to mimic things, 
really what stood out, the big abstractions that ended up standing out were things like feedback control. And feedback control, we can abstract away and then there's no personification. Feedback control, signal processing, um, detection and estimation. These were all things that didn't exist when Wiener wrote cybernetics the first time. And by the time he wrote the second edition, they were now canon of engineering. And it's amazing. And those are deep, like deep mathematical and en- applied concepts that we use all of the time. And I think that that's that big distinction between um, the AI school and what I would call, you know, whatever school I'm in. You know, I do machine learning, but again, I'm looking back to what the uh, uh, the sixties, we just called that pattern recognition. And I'm much happier with that term, honestly. So pattern recognition, control, detection and estimation, signal processing, like these are the cores of engineering mathematics. And I think the powerful thing that the, the electrical engineers did that the artificial intelligence people didn't is they realized that the abstractions themselves are useful and they built all of the information technology of the late 20th century out of this. Uh, and it, you know, I think people, the AI folks, I'm not sure what exactly, I don't know, well, now I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> Go <laughs> what, what, you know, yeah, sure. Let me get myself in trouble. What can we point to are that are the technical artifacts of AI really, um, as opposed to the technological artifacts of this other cybernetical school. Um, again, I don't want to give Wiener all the credit. It's just that he kind of, uh, he, his, his reflection, I think was really nice. And it put in my mind, you know, uh, an understanding of why these things split so hard. Is that, you know, when you start post-World War II, there's no foundations of electrical engineering. I mean, we kind of knew, we knew about feedback. We knew about um, detection estimation. We built a lot of that stuff into, unfortunately, the, the, the technology of war. But solidifying it into a real discipline happened in the subsequent time after the war. And it, it led to like, you know, I mean... It's ama- just compare 1959 to 2022, right? <laughs> and all of the things that went into that with feedback control, with with um, uh, signal processing, detection estimation, it's just, it's just mind blowing. Yeah, I mean, maybe my personal trajectory also biases here in the analysis, but uh, I kind of see that somehow we are approaching a sort of renaissance of cybernetics uh, in a way. I mean, I see a lot of interest in uh, the brain, you know, and neuroscience mm-hmm. as well. Neuralink mm-hmm. is building these new chips that are uh, probably going to read our uh, the yeah, signals in our brains <laughs> incredibly yeah, yeah. fast and maybe act yeah. on them. We don't know. Yeah. I hope not. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you have all these other buzzwords like uh, synthetic biology and even, you know, molds and that solve mm-hmm. optimization problems. So I mm-hmm. wonder whether that will play a role. But I guess this is just an open question to, to tease you. We don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. I think, I think it is interesting. I think that the, um, to me, I think the, the thing that's funny, though, is that this overloading of the word learning, I think, is, is the part that's a little, oh, actually a little suspect to me. It took me until about 2016 to admit that I did machine learning. I always <laughs> told people I do, I do statistics and optimization. I just would refuse to engage with the name because it was always struck me as odd. And honestly, I think it was useful to just say it's pattern recognition, it's pattern classification. Those are just, that's just much, it's kind of boring. Pattern classification is super boring, but it's honest. And useful. <laughs> and useful, yeah. Okay, so maybe it's a good time now to move on, shift gears again. We're going to play a little game. Oh, boy. Uh, The rules... (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So the the rules are simple. I'm going to ask you a this or that question. You need to answer in at most two seconds. And I really want to see System 1 playing. So, you know, in Kahneman's, uh, Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and slow language. Okay, we're going to go fast. All right. Uh, We're going to go fast. So every answer that you give after three seconds is not valid. Okay. And I'm going to just shoot at you a lot of questions. Okay. Tell me when you're ready, we can start. Uh, I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. So working hard or hardly working? Working hard. Robots or dinosaurs? Dinosaurs. Success or happiness? Happiness. Growth or security? Oh, growth. Mm, I don't like either. Guacamole or salsa? Uh, Salsa. Loud neighbors or nosy neighbors? Uh, Nosy neighbors. Pineapple pizza or candy corn? Oh, God, no. (laughs) (laughs) No. (laughs) (laughs) Can't do it. (laughs) Test the waters or dive in the deep end? Uh, 
test the waters, but that's a swimming issue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to go back to that later. Sure. Uh, logic or emotion? Emotion. Zombies or vampires? Vampires. Nyquist or Kalman? Nyquist. Glass half full or glass half empty? Uh, why can't it be both? <laughs> Couch potato or fitness fiend? A fitness fiend. Money or love? Love. Bayesian or frequentist? No, that one I won't answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have a story for that one too, if you want. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go back to that as well. Yeah. Uh, so uh, see the future or change the past? Whoa. Oh, those are like the same, aren't they? <laughs> those are the same. Um, time machine or magic wand? Magic wand. Vacation or staycation? Vacation. LQR or GPT-3? Uh, LQR. Planning or winging it? Depends. Nah, I can't answer that one either. <laughs> that was too hard. Yeah. Dynamic programming or divide and conquer? Uh, dynamic programming. Skill or popularity? Skill. DeepMind or Boston Dynamics? Uh, Boston Dynamics. Poor and happy or rich and miserable? <laughs> Poor and happy. <laughs> that was too easy. Too easy. Um, maths or physics? Maths. Beethoven or Beatles? Beatles. Speeding ticket or parking ticket? Uh, I get more parking tickets. So I don't know <laughs> what that says. <laughs> Machine learning or control? Uh, man, I, I, again, that's another one I can't answer. And this is the last one. It's a good closer. It's a good closer. <laughs> I can't answer that one. We're just... <laughs> so what about the waters? Why, why can't we test the waters? I'm just not, I'm not a very good swimmer. Uh -huh. I, I should be, I, this is something I, I do regret a bit. I can swim. I'm all right, but I, something I should be better at. I just need to practice more. And what about the Bayesian versus frequentist? <laughs> well, my favorite answer to that question is like when someone says, what kind of statistician are you? Is yeah. to say difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the best answer. Yes. The Bayesian frequentist divide actually is not nonsense. You want that middle one, difficult. Um, and I learned that from Philip Stark, who's in our, our uh, statistics department. Someone was pressuring him on that. That's what he said. There is a there is a interesting aspect to that too, and I think if you look at the way that statistician, there are different statisticians, and I think there are some who I think when you say Bayesian or frequentist, it kind of imbues a certain you know uh, kind of faith that one of those two is going to get you to an answer. Where I think that a, a lot, I think the some of the best things that you could do as a statistician is understand the just the limits of both ways of thinking. That's why difficult I think is kind of a. Good one. Okay, so maybe um, this is a good time to take all the questions that we got from the audience uh, offline okay. and ask you just a few, maybe. Um, one that I particularly like is, what is your daily mantra or your favorite quote? Oh man, that's that's a hard one. Do I have a daily mantra? I probably have one and now I'm just forgetting it. Sometimes you get put on the spot and you really gotta think, like, let me think for a second. Um, and also the same person asked, yeah. um, do you have a specific routine in the morning? Like, what do you do in the first 60 minutes of oh, your- see, see that, that's interesting. That I can answer. <laughs> oh, this, the, the favorite quote thing is always tough because I have so many and it's always contextual mm -hmm. as to which one comes up. But, uh, but routine, I, I am definitely, uh, for better or for worse, very a, a man of routine. So like I'll wake up, uh, my cat will wake me up usually between 5.30 and 6 every morning. He comes to the door and really makes, make sure that I'm awake, very important to him. So then usually I'll, I'll you know, I have to feed the cat and then I'll make a coffee and then usually I'll have a small breakfast. And um, often that's when I'll do a lot of Twitter reading just because if I do it when I'm awake, it just is no fun. So that's why I usually try to get that out of the day there. Um, I don't want to read email or anything else. Um, and um, then usually after about... 60 minutes, I'll go and do some exercise. So that's usually that's usually my morning routine. I was about to ask if you're the kind of person that actually wakes up, goes to the gym first thing, and then, you know, starts... Pretty much, yeah. With the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he says it's usually, that's, that's my, you know, the, the, the coffee, some yogurt and some fruit, and then about 60 minutes of silliness, then I'll go exercise. And then, yeah, and then, I go, then, then I'm going to go tackle the day. But that's pretty, pretty regimented as to how, how that will line up. Yeah. I can relate to that. I mean, it's a great yeah. routine. Um, yeah. Okay, so the other question is about um, books, and in particular, what is the book that you've gifted to the the most to other people? Ooh, 
Oh, that's a quick question too. What is the book I forget? Um, you know, I could just let's just go with recent times. So like a book I read very. I mean, I'm sure I have a better answer for the most of all time, but uh, I tend to read. You know, there will be like one or two books a year that will really resonate with me, and I'll tell everyone that they have to read them. And so the most re recent one, which is of the last month, uh, is a book called The Knowledge Machine by Michael Strevens which is a philosophy of science book, but written in a very accessible language and is phenomenal. I feel like it's the first philosophy of science book I've read where I was like, this guy really is explaining what science is, um, what the practice of science is. And it has a very, uh, I don't know, I thought it was a really interesting way to appreciate what we do, um, especially in the applied sciences. So I, th I thought that was a great book. The Knowledge Machine. Yeah. Um, all right, so maybe the last question again from the audience is uh, about redesigning machine learning. And in particular, they ask, mm. uh, if you could redesign ML from scratch, how would you redesign it? Oh, do you think they're asking about the discipline or the course? So remove all the hype that surrounds it now. Yeah. What would you, yeah. what would you change? Well, so I could sell my book now, right? That's what we do at the end of the podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, so <laughs> there we go. So, 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 um, and even that's incomplete. Uh, so, but Moritz Hart and I wrote a book called um, uh, Patterns, Predictions, and Actions, which was our attempt to figure out what would we want to teach a graduate course in machine learning. And it's, it's, I, I really like it. I mean, I do think that this is kind of a, the, uh, would be a book I teach from for a long time. Of course, as soon as the book went to the publisher, I told Moritz, oh, no, we have to rewrite the whole thing. And then he got, he didn't want to hear that because he's right. I shouldn't do that. But I still have ideas about how to iterate and how we might how we might change it down the line. But, um, you know, walking you through that book, we start with um, the elements of detection theory, which is, you know, I, I do think where it's the reasonable starting point for classification. Um, from detection theory alone, just making decisions and prediction and making decisions, um, you already start to run into all of these tricky issues about the best you could possibly do and what happens when there's like hidden uh, heterogeneity and you just there's all sorts of things that come out of that. Um, from from there though, once we say okay, well, okay, we're going to do this anyway, we're going to do this kind of dis decision making. The the thing we move to is um, you know supervised learning, and it's kind of a nice jump. You know, supervised learning is, you know, how you would do prediction when I don't necessarily know the way that the data is coming to me. And um, so then we dive into supervised learning. We spend about, I think when we teach the course, about half the course is on supervised learning. And we talk about, you know, feature representations and where those might come from and how you could build new ones. And then we talk about optimization, which is really key. And we, we have a simplified view there, but, you know, I think there's, I, I honestly think that most people who do a first course in machine learning really should take a second course in optimization. Um, we also talk about generalization and generalizability, which to me, we just kind of go through a lot of different ideas that people have. Um, and some of them are satisfying and some of them are not. But we connect back to these ideas from the 70s and 60s about like we knew a lot of these. Um, these concepts are old and like the way we approach them are old. And most of them are sensitivity, just like you said. If you have a prediction that's, very insensitive to changes in the data is probably going to be similar on new data. So that's an interesting um, thing there. Then we have this whole chapter on data and data sets, which I think uh, I've never, nobody else has done in a book, which like that's kind of like most of the field now is about data. So we really dive into data sets, why they exist, why they persist. Uh, what do we do after that? I mean, I can keep going. It's great. So that after that, we have like five pages on deep learning. And then we move to I think this is the thing that's interesting. After the five pages on deep learning, we move to, you know, what happens when you're trying to make predictions and you're not in a static world anymore? Touching on notions of causality, we talk about optimal control, we talk about reinforcement learning. So I think that that pivot in the middle is very interesting. And I think that that's the stuff that we have to, I mean, it's still, I'm not sure I'm happy with any of the answers that we have there. I don't think, I think they're just things that we should know as we move forward. But I think those are the places where I'm most interested still to, to look at machine learning is like what happens when you move away from the static frame to this dynamic frame. It's just, we're still figuring it out. Yeah, I guess a book always can be seen as a picture of the zeitgeist, if yeah. you want, of, of yeah, the time. That's right. And I'm just particularly interested about the uh, chapter on data sets. Uh, yeah. I think that's a great idea uh, because it doesn't really get talked about uh, 
I guess in any book that, that I've seen. Uh, do you <laughs> touch yet. on the standardization issues or? Uh, yeah, so we, we touched on a variety of aspects there. And um, oh, also just for the people listening, the book is available for free. Uh, uh, early version of the book is available for free at mlstory.org. Um, and uh, I think that's right. And we'll correct that after the fact or add it to the latter notes, the correct uh, the correct link there. But um, the, you know, the, the data set chapter talks about some of the existing data sets and how they were created. And actually we go through this whole study of just like the history of the data set. Like why did we even standardize these things to begin with? Uh, it's really fascinating. I mean, it, w there's this amazing story that Moritz and I found about um, the first data set for handwritten character recognition, which is, you know, as everybody's bread and butter favorite application of machine learning. And the first data set is from 1959. It's crazy. Wow, that's that's really crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. And the story behind that data set is just incredible. It's this, you know, there was this fellow named Bill Heileman. He was working at Bell Labs. Um, he was tasked with making, everybody was trying to make uh, OCR readers at the time. Um, which is kind of crazy to think that you're trying to do that in 19 in the 50s, but they, they were trying. And um, that, that, let me just tell a couple of things about this. This is one of my favorite stories. Um, the first thing was that they didn't realize. I mean, what Bill's thought was most people were trying to build end-to-end -end devices because that was you know personal computers were not really that big a thing. And Bill was like, I can't design it unless I could kind of abstract this somehow. So he, his idea was to have two abstractions. You would have a scanner that would produce data. And then once you had the data stored, you would have the second step of the simu you would simulate the rest of the process on one of their big computers. Wow. Like now this sounds obvious, but it was not yeah, at all obvious. But at the time is quite ambitious, I guess. <laughs> yeah, quite ambitious. <laughs> and so, so what he did was he built a scanner um, that was supposed to be a general purpose scanner. And he collected uh, 50 different alphabets from 50 different writers and uh, put them on punch cards and then let people, and then published a paper. Uh, it was kind of this weird thing where he published a paper on these then someone else grabbed them. And, well, actually I remember, this is a good story. He published a paper saying somebody else's method wasn't good. <laughs> That's always the start of a paper, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> this is always how it goes. <laughs> and that guy, his name, his name was Bledsoe, who was at, at, uh, in Stanford at the time, or in Palo Alto at the time, to, you know, asked, well, I think you're doing this wrong. Can you send me your cards? And so Heileman sent the cards to Bledsoe and then uh, Bledsoe published some other paper. And then uh, this fellow Chow was also really famous for a lot of things in um, machine learning. Chow got a copy of them, did his own uh, analysis. Uh, Duda and Hart at SRI got a copy. And so, you know, Bill has this amazing uh, short note in one of the IEEE journals that said that like, I made these this data. If you want it, here's my mailing address. I'll print them for you. And he's sending a shoebox of 1,800 punch cards around the country. I guess that was what that was the way the data was disseminated. Fantastic. Um, physically, I think the <laughs> physically, physically, and I think one of the uh, another like just fun quirk about that story is that he. Um, well, there are two fun quirks. First of all, Bill wrote the first paper I've ever seen on training versus test split. So yeah, I think, and everybody just naturally came to this conclusion that you use the first 40 alphabets for, for training and last 10 for testing. It was very natural. And Bill actually wrote a, a paper trying to justify it, which is great. And the second thing that was fascinating is in 1962, he published a PhD thesis on this work and then left machine learning for the rest of his career <laughs> because, because he just considered the project a failure. No way. He, cons he considered it a failure. And it's amazing. He led to everything since. And no one's heard of this man, Bill Bill Hyman. What he went to work on was uh, computer networks because he's like, I obviously doesn't want to send around shoe boxes of punch cards anymore. Um, he did a lot of interesting work in high performance computing after after this. But uh, he just considered that you know the, the machines weren't there. And it's kind of wild to just watch over the course of, you know, uh, several decades, uh, everything really came together, and now OCR is effectively solved, um, but not using anything dramatically more sophisticated than what he proposed. You just needed the technology to catch up. I guess this is also a fantastic message for all those PhD students out there hitting their PhD blues. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you Who may knows? not know whether you know your work is going to end up unfolding as 
pioneering yeah. in 50 years. Yeah, amazing. And this is also a fantastic assist maybe for my next and possibly last question before we move yeah. on to music. Um, <laughs> this is uh, something that I would actually, probably I'm going to ask to everybody else on the podcast. And okay. it's about future students. If you were a student today, uh, what would you do or what would you invest on rather? In the sense that what would you need to do to live a life that you would be proud of? What's your best advice? I mean, this comes back to what we talked about at the beginning. I mean, to me, it's just like if you're, there's ups and downs in a research career and it's not necessarily for everyone. And if you could think of something else to do, I would just say you should do that. Something else that inspires and fulfills you, you should do that. But if this is what keeps you up at night, uh, just make sure that you're always reminding yourself of why. Like, yeah, this is like reminding yourself that, yeah, this keeps, I'm passionate about this. This is why I'm passionate about this. And this is why I'm going to keep doing it. I think that's like, you know, being in touch with that is super important. And the other thing I would say to everybody is like the topic never really matters. I think it's this making sure you're enjoying the work. And then for me, this is not true for everyone, but for me, it was also the interactions with my, um, fellow graduate students that really just kept me going. I think, you know, chatting with, you're in this weird opportunity to be around a bunch of brilliant other people who know a lot of different things than you and taking advantage of that resource and, you know, stepping out of your department even. You know, I, so I, again, I said, I went to a, an interesting program at MIT called the Media Lab, but there I was surrounded with people who, you know, worked on nanotechnology, who worked on uh, machine learning, who worked on education of kids who worked on electronic art, who worked on computer net. It was just such a diverse, weird group of people. And it's just that that kind of uh, getting a bunch of people like that under one roof and letting them do whatever they want. is just kind of a powerful, um, uh, amazing thing to experience. And this in, this in general, I think is great advice and I'm pretty sure we will resonate with many out there. Um, I guess this brings me to the last uh, topic of today and the uh, um, the next question, will, or question rather, topic of discussion, if you want, will be about music. So while doing my homework for uh, this podcast uh, episode, I found out that you're uh, a brilliant and very accomplished musician. I found that Thank super you. interesting. I personally like many of your uh, tracks. Uh, and um, I just thought it would be interesting to, to dig into this a little bit and maybe ask you what's your relationship with music how did it all start and yeah. how do you manage to have such a successful career at the academic level and also keep such a passion alive in the way you do it yeah i've always loved music i mean i bought my first guitar when i was i think uh, i think 13 12 or 13 started playing there and then Classic. i was just kind of hooked. yeah i was just hooked i was just hooked after that and um you know i think that there was always um so it's always been something that I've been passionate about. It's always been something I, I, you know, of course, also when you're a teenager, feel like you could do that for a living, which is not for, I mean, to those who can, more power to you. And I, I love it and just pursue it. But, you know, not everybody can. It's definitely, I think, a little bit easier to become a professor than a professional musician, especially one who could live. So you're stating that becoming a professor at Berkeley is easier than becoming a professional musician. I worry that that might be. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's a, it's a hard hustle being. Sorry, sorry to intervene, but it was no, just so funny. I, I, I do, I do worry that it's a hard hustle for the for my musician friends. I mean, I think some of them have been, um, you know, I, th I think the ones who've been successful have been very entrepreneurial and really thought hard about what exactly they wanted from that career path that they were choosing. Choosing, but it's been hard for 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 a lot of them, and I think it's. You know, there's a lot of passion that goes into it. Um, but I'll say that, like, up until my late 20s, I still kind of had a dream. <laughs> so it took a long time for me to uh, to shake that idea uh, of being a professional musician. And, and you're still an active musician in the sense, I mean, we yeah. chatted about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, yeah. of you being active also during the pandemic. Yeah, no, and I think the 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 funny thing now is that so I, I still in a I have a one very active recording project uh, that's called the Fun Years. My bandmate and I, I don't know, we're both you know in our forties and we haven't really figured out this how to release our back catalog, but we're we're thinking about it. It's going to come out, and we definitely have some new stuff that we want to put out soon. 
We just haven't figured out how. Yeah, so to the audience out there that are listening to this podcast, please hit a like on Spotify or wherever you listen to your music. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> Shameless uh, help us. advertisement help us. also in this respect. Yeah. Actually, yeah. with your permission, I'm going to ask you to close this episode with uh, my favorite track, which whose name, if I'm correct, is uh, Breach on the Bowstring. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good So one. with this, we're going to close this episode. And uh, Ben, thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank you for listening. I hope you liked the show today. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, support on Patreon or PayPal, and connect with us on social media platforms. See you next time.